Hey everyone, this lesson is on complications of measles infections, including mild and severe complications. We'll also talk about methods in order to diagnose measles. We'll talk about ways we can treat measles, and we're also gonna talk about how we can try to prevent measles from occurring in the first place. So that leads me on to complications of measles in general. So this can occur in anybody who has been infected with measles. Complications are quite common in measles infections. They occur in approximately one third of cases. Complications can be mild or severe, or very severe. Some of the milder ones can include an inner ear infection like otitis media. So here's an image of a tympanic membrane with essentially pus behind it and causing a bulging tympanic membrane. So that is one of the milder complications. But really what I want to discuss is the fact that measles infections can be fatal. That's why vaccinations are extremely important with regards to measles infections. And a lot of times we see fatality rates being the highest in developing countries. Percentages are estimated to be between 4 to 10 percent. So 10, you can imagine 10 percent of measles infections can be fatal. One part of this that is tied into the fatality of measles infections is what we call measles-induced immunosuppression. Being infected with measles can cause you to become immunosuppressed. It can dampen and reduce your immune system function. What happens is this can increase your risk for becoming infected with secondary infections like bacterial infections, other viral infections. This is tied in with inner ear infections. So the immunosuppression from the measles can lead to infections with some bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, or more Xella catarralis, leading to inner ear infections. It can also lead to infections like pneumonia. So the immunosuppression from a measles infection is very important. Encephalitis is also a huge complication with regards to measles. It's estimated that as many as one in 1,000 measles infections leads to encephalitis. Encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain. Encephal means brain, itis means inflammation. So individuals can get a headache, fever, and altered mental status. And this seems to occur usually within a few days of the rash itself. So this is when it usually happens. And then individuals can even have symptoms like vomiting and stiff neck and drowsiness and those types of symptoms as well. Some other complications of measles includes an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM. And another very important complication that occurs later on, it's a delayed complication, is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, or SSPE. This is the one I really want to focus on here. This is the one where an individual who had measles in the past gets through it fine, but around 7 to 10 years later, they start to have issues. And what happens in SSPE is that a lot of times it happens in kids. So kids have had measles and then seven to 10 years later, they have this SSPE. They start to have issues at school. They start to have issues with their memory. And then they have sleeplessness and, and they begin to have hallucinations. And a lot of times SSPE is fatal and there's no treatment for it. Some other complications include measles inclusion body encephalitis, MIBE. It's another type of encephalitis. It occurs in immunocompromised patients, and if you're to look inside their brain, you can see inclusion bodies. You can also see giant cell pneumonia. We can have blindness from measles infections. And there are specific things that occur with measles infections during pregnancy. And some of these include an increased incidence of the following, like having a baby born early, prematurity, intrauterine fetal death, spontaneous abortion, and low birth weight. So a lot of things can happen if a mother becomes infected with measles during pregnancy. So again, measles infections during pregnancy can cause complications with baby's health. So again, we see increased incidences of prematurity. So babies born less than 37 weeks of gestational age higher rates of intrauterine fetal death, higher rates of spontaneous abortion, and lower birth weights. So even though the baby may survive, the low birth weight and the prematurity can lead to issues like failure to thrive. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat measles? The diagnosis of measles is often a clinical diagnosis. We 
diagnose it by looking at the history in physical examination. So we see that the child or the individual had a fever, then a rash that progressed from the head to toe or top to bottom. That is kind of how we make the diagnosis. We follow those stages and we look at those signs and symptoms to make an informed diagnosis. We could do serology testing, so we could look for antibodies against measles. We can look for anti-measles IgM antibodies. That would be a way we could diagnose this as well. And we could use PCR or polymerase chain reaction to detect viral genetics. That is another way to diagnose measles. How do we treat it? There's several different things we have to take into account with treatment of measles. If the patient is infected with measles, if they're infected, there's really not much we can do. It's a supportive treatment. Because it's a viral infection, there's not a lot we can do. There are a couple things though. I don't wanna leave it at that. Vitamin A supplementation has been shown to help reduce morbidity and mortality of a measles infection. Remember that one of the risk factors for getting measles and having a more severe presentation of measles is a vitamin A deficiency. So if we supplement individuals who are infected with measles with vitamin A, we can help reduce some of these signs and symptoms. Vitamin A supplementation usually occurs for two days and it's dependent on age. You can look at these international units as a reference. There is also some evidence for using the antiviral ribavirin. So because there are so many bad complications of a measles infection, if the individual has a very severe, severe presentation and you're worried about complications, you can try ribavirin as well. And what's also important is respiratory isolation. You wanna isolate the infected individual because you don't want them spreading it around to other individuals. Now, if the patient has been exposed, but they're not necessarily infected, if it's less than 72 hours before exposure, you can give them the vaccination. If it's less than six days, so it's more than 72 hours, but it's less than six days or less than seven days, you can give them immunoglobulin G. And that can help prevent or reduce the possibility of getting an infection of measles or reduce the severity of the measles infection. But the best thing we can do is try to prevent becoming infected with measles in the first place. And the best way to do that is using the MMR or MMRV vaccinations. So measles, mumps, rubella, and V for varicella vaccinations. And these are live vaccinations, so you don't use them during pregnancy. And we see the evidence of how effective vaccinations can be by looking at data from the World Health Organization. So World Health Organization has estimated that there has been a 73% reduction in cases of measles worldwide between the years 2000 to 2018. And it's in large part to widespread vaccination. So because of all of those complications we talked about and those delayed complications like the subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, it's very important to have vaccinations to prevent measles from occurring in the first place. So to review, we diagnose measles clinically by history and physical examination. We can do serology testing looking for specific antibodies against measles, or we could do PCR to check for viral genetics. For treatment, it depends on if the patient has been infected or exposed. If they have been infected, most of the time it's supportive measures. We want to treat their symptoms, but it's also important to supplement them with vitamin A and in severe cases of measles, in order to reduce the possibility of complications of measles, we can use ribavirin. If a patient is exposed to measles but is not infected, there are a couple of ways we can deal with that. If it's very short term after the exposure, we can use the MMR or MMRV vaccination. And if it's a bit longer, within about a week or so, we can give them immunoglobulin G. With regards to prevention, very, very key is vaccination. So we can use the MMR or MMRV vaccinations, measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella vaccination. Again, this is a live vaccine, so don't use it when a patient is pregnant and don't use it when the patient is immunocompromised. And the reason we use vaccinations is because they have been shown to be very, very helpful in reducing the rates of measles infections and ultimately reducing the devastating complications of measles. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. 
And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn, and I hope to see you next time.